Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session. Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this morning, we are going to talk about why Jamaica is paradise for foreigners, for tourists, yet a hell for many Jamaicans, right? That is the whole topic of our conversation this morning. I hope that you will be, you know, nourished um, intellectually and that you will seek to do further research on the topics or on the matters that I'm about to discuss in this video. Very important that we begin to reflect profoundly upon what is happening in the island of Jamaica. I mean, we have been hearing a lot of things and people have been preaching a lot of things and we have witnessed a lot of things, but I think now is the time. We are in a moment of urgency to transform the, con the, 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 the country that, you know, called Jamaica or have it be burnt. Remember now that in 2012, they're about, the IMF was saying, if Jamaica did not want to accept its package, it's a structural adjust, uh, adjustment package that the United States, the United States Treasury, the IMF, should allow Jamaica to burn. And people are thinking that the IMF is a democratic institution. It is not a democratic institution. It is run by the military industrial complex of the United States. And there is nothing democratic about the U.S. military industrial complex. It seems to me that I have to repeat that every time in my video for people to understand, because they think when the IMF sends or, you know, or prepares money or offers a loan to Jamaica, that that loan is something that is transparent, that is true, and you think that it is going to do what it says it's going to do. And we have been hearing for the longest while now, since 2013, since we inked out an agreement with the IMF, that we were on a very prosperous path. That if we just dr drank the bitter medicine in 2013, that we our economy would have been lifted off the road of, you know, desperation and poverty, and we would have landed into the land of milk and honey. And that has not happened after more than 10 years after a decade that has not taken place our economy has neither found itself on the road of prosperity nor has it been able to grow as the imf and the ministers of finance dr peter phillips dr audley shaw and dr nigel clark have been reporting we must understand that they have been lying to us. They have bamboozled us. They have tricked us into believing that they are actually at the helm of creating a prosperous economy when they are actually destroying it. That's what they're doing. And I'm not sure that the locals are destroying it deliberately. Some might be, but the ones who are working for the IMF, the, the, the ministers of finance, we know that they are indirectly working with the IMF, and they are doing exactly as the IMF proposes. It is not what they say that they present proposals to you and you choose the proposal that is best for your economy. That is not true. The IMF has been lying through its teeth, and it has been doing so for decades now. And we've got to understand it. We've got to wake up and see what's going on. Now, Yesterday, um, Maziki, I think he's a professor at the University of the West Indies, um, Mona Campus, Maziki Fane, and the article that he wrote in the In Focus, The Costs of Dr. Clark's Success, right? So, doc, and he's putting quote-unquote success, right? The cost, because there's a cost to it. Remember now that there's a cost to the, the oligarchy becoming rich. There's a cost to having so many billionaires in the world. There's a cost to having, you know, um, people who have these multinational and big farm and big oil. There is a cost to all of these things. And sometimes we tend to look upon these people as if miraculously or that they are gifted with a great amount of intellectual acuity that the normal man is not endowed with. And if you look beneath the fray, you are going to realize that that is not true, that many of them are thieves, they're criminals, 
right? They are looters and they are more so than the persons who you think are the ones who are in prison right now, right? Now, let me share that this article with you by the professor at the University of the West Indies because I thought it was a very well written article and I'm happy that the Gleaner published it because they're not about publishing dissenting voices. And this is a dissenting voice as regards Dr. Claude's success story. And notice that we haven't heard anything from, well, we have heard through a sentence or two statements made by the former uh, prime ministers of Jamaica and some other notable persons in Jamaica, prominent Jamaican you know, finance ministers like the Dr. Peter Phillips, but we haven't heard, the, we haven't seen them written an entire article you know, in which they flesh out what will be the consequences of Nigel Clark's appointment and why the IMF would have given him such a very high-ranking position. Nobody has said that, you know, about just glowing and emotional responses, because a lot of what comes from Jamaica is not true, right? It's just mere fluff and, you know, just to use words for words' sake. No, Dr. Nigel Clark, we see him. It is hoped that Jamaican can separate their desire to celebrate an individual's personal success as a Jamaican from what is good for Jamaica. So we have to separate the individual success from what is good for Jamaica. And this is a success story for Dr. Clark and his family, right? This is not a success story for the Jamaican people at large. The most it will do is say that he's Jamaican, but it doesn't mean anything because you have other people from different countries poor countries as well who work for the IMF and it doesn't mean their countries are doing better, right? We would, for instance, want to celebrate that a daughter of Jamaica in the person of Kamala Harris could rise to the presidency of the United States. And I'm happy that he's making this analogy. We would applaud her success as being the first woman and being the first woman of African descent and being one of us. But we should not be naive, which we are. We should not think that U.S. foreign policy will necessarily be in the highest interest of people like us just because one of us sits in the presidential seat of power. And if you look at the persons with whom Kamala is connected, we know that she's not going to be defending the interest of Black people or defending the interest of people of color. We already know, we can see, but a lot of times people do not like to face the realities. Like Jamaicans, Americans do not also like to face the reality, right? We like to think that we're living in this pseudo world in which there is going to be a better world. There's a better world tomorrow. And I'm not suggesting here that we should not all believe in a better world. I think we should. I think we should aim for a better world. At the same time, we cannot, when we see things before our eyes, think that there's going to be a better tomorrow when the foundation that is being laid suggests that we are going to have a dictatorial and autocratic and authoritarian society. We cannot do that. We cannot begin to think that that is what is, go is going to happen. What is happening in our world and the pandemic also unveiled that, unpacked that reality is that people like to follow the crowd and the majority they think that they are intellectuals and that they know what is going to happen. And how can I vote for Trump? Because Trump is the authoritarian. And if we should just study a little bit more, and not that Trump is any great man, because Trump is not, but sometimes we've got to call a spade a spade. And when we look at the war machine called the Democratic Party, it is more of a war machine than the Republican Party at the moment in terms of its base. The base does not want war, but you really wonder if the base of the Democratic Party desires war, because why are they supporting the neocons in the Democratic Party? But let me not stray from what we are about. We're talking about Jamaica, but I just like to show you that there is a lot of correlation you know, in our world between what is happening in the United States, what is happening in Jamaica, what is happening just across the world. People tend not to be thinkers. They have taken off their critical thinking hats and they no longer desire to think because they realize that they're living in a spotty and messy world. Similarly, we should be raising questions about our Minister of Finance's appointment as Deputy Managing Director at the International Monetary Fund, even if we may recognize that his personal success may mean that Jamaicans are able to push themselves to presumed higher heights than whatever they can achieve at home. 
the Prime Minister tells us that this, as his appointment, is indicative of the success of his administration. What does success mean exactly? Success of what administration? What has the GLP government done to have lifted Jamaicans out of poverty? and to have made the economy more prosperous. We, 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 we see that we have an onslaught of our best of minds, our most highly educated people are leaving annually. 80% of our university graduates leave Jamaica per annum. They immigrate to another country. If we recall the historical relationship of the IMF to countries like ours and in a global system of inequality, which produces significant poverty and very little wealth and favors the rich over the poor, we might not be so ready to applaud. And I'm wondering if we're suffering from amnesia. What has the IMF done to have rebranded itself as this transformative economic organization? I don't know. What have they done? Yet, many people around the world seem to be impressed by them and think, that in fact, they have, they have eventually found um, and are now walking on the road of Damascus and are now baptized into this organization of equality in which the rich is highly concerned about what happens to the poor. And that is not true. We might recognize instead that Minister Clark's ascension may have come at a great cost to the majority in this nation. We might recognize that the interests of the IMF are not necessarily those of Jamaica. And not might, they are not. And what is needs to be talked about too is what country can we say has been a success story for the IMF, a country that has been obedient to the IMF policies. And we have seen where they have been successful in their economic policies. There has been none to date. And the IMF was, you know, was founded in 1947, right? So how is it that we think that this, their policies are going to transform the Jamaican economy? That is never going to happen. Now, listen to what he says. In the neoliberal period since the 1980s, the logic of trickle-down economics said the state should withdraw from being obligated to engender development and serve the interests of the majority and instead facilitate the interests of the owners of capital. Presumably, if the wealth of the owners of capital grew, so too would that of the people. That has not happened. The people remain poor and the wealthy are even wealthier. They're richer. That is what we have to understand. Right. As a lender, the IMF is most concerned with recovering the money it has loaned. As a player in the global political economy, it represents the interests of its richest members who vote in a weighted system that allows them to determine global economic policy. In the 1980s, the IMF was, along with the World Bank, the major force for imposing structural adjustment on poor countries. Structural adjustment based on neoliberal economics was said to make countries better able to pay their debt which is not true. Among the features of structural adjustment was austerity, reduced expenditure on social and public goods as a means to create surplus fiscal space to repay debt. Essentially, it means that the needs of people were to be set to the side so that governments could repay debt. It means therefore that money that would have been spent in healthcare, in education, right, to help the poor, to uplift them, cannot no longer be spent because it has to be diverted to paying down the debt. This has been the role that Nigel Clark has played in the office of Minister of Finance. And he has played it very well with distinction. And that is what the people like the Dr. Orlando Patterson's, that is what they're talking about. They're not talking about Nigel Clark of lifting the economy. They're talking about him being the saint, as it were, of neoliberalism of neocolonialism, a nice and wonderful house Negro. He has played that role very well and we should applaud him for that role, but we can't applaud him for building the Jamaican economy, it's the opposite. He is an enabler and, and a better of destroying the demolition of Jamaica's economic infrastructure. 
And that is what we have to understand. And we have not yet begun to understand that reality. I don't know why we haven't. Some may argue that if countries take loans, they are morally obliged to repay their debts. And that is true. We have to, but that's not what the IMF does. And that is that. And it's true. And we think people should honor their debt. And on this channel, we do not support giving give outs and handouts, I should say, and to just give people and people should not be held accountable and responsible. What we're suggesting is that the IMF has to do that with some amount of moral conscience, and they have not been doing that. How can you be strangling a nation to reduce its debt to 60% of GDP when you have countries like the United States with a debt of 123% per, uh, percent per GDP? Yeah, Jamaica is has to go down to 60 and then perhaps lower, I don't know. Because every time we go lower, it seems that we have to go lower. And the lower we go, it's the more, you know, destitute we become because the more monies that are being transferred from the poor to the wealthy. Right? That's what the IMF is all about. Transferring the money from the poor, the destitute, the impoverished, to the wealthy person of the society, to the social, to the economic oligarchs. All countries did not begin at the same place in the global e political economy. Descendants of enslaved Africans, formerly colonized people, did not begin independence with compensation for their impoverishment and underdevelopment through slavery and colonialism. Debt was one result of inequality, but also how countries are treated when they have debt is a matter of power. It means that the rules differ. The United States with a debt to GDP ratio of 123% in 2023 has no obligations to reach the 60% ratio that Jamaica has agreed to meet. It means, therefore, that Jamaicans are subsidizing, as it were, and they're cushioning America's middle and wealthy class. And that is why when people immigrate, they're saying, we are heading to the United States because the United States has stolen our resources. And that is why we are, we are migrating. And even if we are illegal immigrants, and I'm not supporting illegal immigration, but what I, you have to understand that what the IMF is doing is also illegal. The country should have made it. Well, perhaps it's legal in the sense that we have allowed ourselves, just like slavery was legal, but it is, I should say, that it is repugnant, right? And it should not be legal. But our governments have been forced to make such, uh, you know, austere policies legal. Should we be thinking about how to make the system more level or should we be joining up as poster children of the IMF? Right? We're joining up as poster children of the IMF and people are laughing at us. People are laughing at us. This is what I want to read you before I end this article. This year, with a $1,341 billion budget, $490 billion is allocated to principal and interest payments on debt. So most of the money is going towards debt payment. Meanwhile, the people suffer food insecurity. Teachers are migrating because they cannot make life in Jamaica. The health sector is under tremendous stress. Hospitals are lacking beds, medicine and testing machines. Parochial roads are like riverbeds. Public transport is inefficient, perilous, and undignified. Communities don't have piped water, and generally people are in a constant state of misery attempting to cope with daily living. But yet still you're hearing that Jamaica is prosperous and is on a path for development. Its macroeconomics are great. And we've been hearing this since 2000. 14, 15, 16, until now. Successive ministers of finance have bamboozled the people, the Jamaican people, into thinking that way. It's almost that like they're repeating indirectly. Hebrews 1 verse 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The difference between that, because this is not a religion now, this is economics, but it is a religious practice. The IMF is almost like it's a, you know, economic fundamental, fundamentalist organization, which is almost like it's a religious organization, right? Because people have faith in this thing that if you lower your debt to GDP or 60% of GDP, that you are going to miraculously become a prosperous nation. And there's no, there are no steps being taken 
to push us to a productive. We are not even producing. There's nothing that we're producing. So how are we going to be in a productive society? Most of what we consume in Jamaica are imported from abroad. So how, what sort of prosperous nation are we alluding to? Right? We know that this is a bunch of nonsense. But the majority of Jamaicans believe it, including the people at UW, the UWI, at the University of the West Indies. Right? They believe all of this nonsense. They believe all of this nonsense. And Jamaicans just think because they are learned people or they are supposedly learned people, right? Because many of them are not learned, if we would understand, they know what is best and they are speaking the truth when they articulate their sentiments. But oftentimes, the people at the University of the West Indies, the economic professors are just reading from textbooks. And the textbooks are written and um, supported by these liberal neoliberal people, right? This is that's what that's what happens. You know, it's not that the textbooks are there to to give us um, facts and and to transform our world, as it were. Right? It's not there to do that. That's not what it's there to do. Now, this is an article that was written by Lisa Hanna, I believe, Let's Reduce Food Prices. And now when she was in government, she wasn't doing that. Her government wasn't, well, she wasn't the Minister of Finance, so I can't blame her for not doing that. But she evidently, her party and her minister, then Minister of Finance, did not lower food price. Food prices have always been high and too high in Jamaica. In fact, Jamaica has one of the highest food prices in the world, even though it is one of the most impoverished countries in the world, right? So allow that to sink in, right? Allow that to sink in. Now, food in Jamaica, she says, is expensive. No one can buy that or no one can deny that. She's suggesting Jamaicans pay some of the highest food prices in the world, and it doesn't matter where you shop what time of the day or what time of year for many Jamaicans, it is a daily struggle to buy food. So even to buy food is a problem in Jamaica, yet still our macroeconomic fundamentals are impressive. Right? Our macroeconomics are impressive. Now listen to what Lisa Hanna is saying. For households that, that relied on savings, 50% said their savings could only last two weeks. 30% said they could only last one week and 18% for one day. So their savings don't amount to anything. Why? Because of inflation. And many people are talking to me and they're suggesting to me about what they hear about inflation, what the Bank of Jamaica publishes, but that is not true. What is true is what happens in the real world. And if their savings, if 50% of their savings could only last two weeks and 30% they could only last for one week and 18% for one day, then it means therefore that our inflation is out of whack. And what the Bank of Jamaica is reporting is evidently not true. And we have to, the reality is in the one, the proof of the pudding, right? by eating it. And eating it, I mean that spending the money and having our savings, it should last us for a longer time. Consequently, many children in these living situations experience them and continue to face daily food shortages. Often a mother can only give one meal daily and pray that this child gets lunch at school, which in some cases they don't offer lunch at school. Right now, listen to what Lisa Hanna is saying. I spoke to several minimum wage earners, that is sixty thousand dollars monthly, which can't do anything, and they told me they shop every fortnight when they get paid and spend a budget of eight thousand or sixteen thousand monthly. Monthly, they only buy the essentials. They only buy the essentials, rather bread, oil, rice, flour, sugar, chicken, back, salt, and tin mackerel, tea and cocoa, um, cornmeal, ground provisions, and sardines, thin or frozen mixed vegetables. They don't buy fruit, as that is too expensive. Fruit in Jamaica is very expensive. A nation that is a tropical island that should be producing, manufacturing these things, you know, they can't afford fruit. Neither do they eat chicken every day that is saved for Sunday, which is reserved for chicken parts. Many Jamaicans cannot afford certain protein, especially chicken. They can't buy chicken, 
right? Because it's just not affordable. It's not affordable. That is what we, this is the country that we're living in, yet we are celebrating Dr. Clark's IMF appointment as one of the deputy managing directors. This is the nation that we are living in, a nation that has a lot of buffoons as its, leader, as its leaders. Now we're hearing from the IMF that IMF approves 1.2 billion rainy day funds for Jamaica. Jamaica has secured some access to 1.2 billion US dollars, 193 billion Jamaican dollars in rainy day funds from International Monetary Fund following a successful review of its financial support programs. And it just was a lot of nonsense, right? A lot of fluff, nothing that tells us what program we are involved in, what will be the memorandum of, memorandum of understanding. We don't know what where we are. Are we at 58% of GDP? We just don't know what's going on with the IMF. We're just hearing some, they're just doing some writings, nothing that is investigative. It's just reporting, he says, she says, right? Because that's what Jamaica is all about. You have to fool the people. You've got to ensure that they are constantly in obscurity, that they're constantly in the dark, right? Because they are not sensible people. And the IMF knows that. The IMF knows that. Just like the Democratic Party of the United States understand that the Democratic loyalists are not sensible people. So they can bamboozle them by entertaining them and letting them know that they're the party of equality when they're doing everything. All their policies are policies that aid and abet inequality. But people tend to believe words and they like to see when people are dressed up nicely and they have lots of money and the camera shines on them very brilliantly. People tend to believe that rather than sitting down and working out problems, reading. And that's the only way you're going to solve the problems by reading and comparing and contrasting and making correlations. But the majority of people, including people with advanced degrees, do not have the competency, do not have the brain power, do not have that intellectual capacity to think because they have been so brainwashed. I don't care. I'm going to vote for the PNP. I don't care. I'm going to vote for the GLP because I'm just following in the direction of what my friends tell me to do. Most of my friends are doing it. Most of my co-workers, my colleagues, are doing it. So I have to do it because it makes sense. And I don't want to be the person who is standing up and to be the person who seems to be bizarre and to be strange. And if you're going to think logically and critically in this world, you will have to be prepared to stand alone. Because the vast majority of the people in the world are people who do not have the ability to think and to think critically and logically and rationally. The social media have not even enhanced or ability to think. In some cases, it, you can allow it to if you know how to use information, but many people are allowing their emotions to run amok. And as a result of that, they are confused. Now, let's look at the there is a video that was produced on YouTube and um, we're not having these intellectual discussions, how the IMF and the West debt trapped Ethiopia, an African country, right? So the IMF and the World Bank, and these people are sitting down. Africa is having an intellectual conversation about the IMF and the World Bank, and they're thousands of miles away. Jamaica at the backyard, in the backyard of the United States, the citizens, most of the citizens, including those at the University of the West Indies and or major universities, do not understand the history and the role of the IMF and the World Bank. Right? And what has happened? What transformation? Because in the 70s and the 80s, and perhaps in the early 90s, I would say more the same the 70s and the 80s, Jamaicans were aware of it. But perhaps because Mr. Sierra was in office. Perhaps that's why you were more interested in having those strikes because you were striking against an American man, a man that was known to have been connected with this, the, the Central Intelligence Agency, 
bribed the CIA. That's why you were protesting. But when the PNP came in and they were the party of socialism and, this, and this, they were socialists. So whatever they do, it's different because they have this rhetoric of equality, just like the Democratic Party. So whatever, no matter what the Democratic Party does in America, Black people will, the majority of them will still vote for, for, for the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is viewed as a party of voting rights and social justice and social equity. When the opposite is true. Right? It is not that it believes in that. All its policies, if you read carefully the history, and even at the current moment, are geared towards inequity. And the same thing happens in Jamaica. The PNP, which is almost like the Democratic Party, right? They have the same sort of social justice agenda. At the same time, when you look carefully at their policies, we find that that is not true. We find that their policies are neoliberal and promote structural, the Structural Adjustment Program and austerity of the IMF and the World Bank. Right? So when are you going to wake up and understand that neither the Jamaica Labour Party nor the PNP means you very well and that their policies remain the same? And that is why when Dr. Clark was, his appointment was announced, they were so enamored and happy to see him going to the International Monetary Fund. Right? Because it's a way of fooling you Jamaicans also that somebody, we are the poster child of the IMF. And if you have this very important PhD graduate from Oxford University going to the IMF, it means therefore that he was so astute that he transformed the economy when he did not. But you cannot look beyond the fluff. You cannot look beyond the super, the superficial, the superficiality. You only see what you are seeing and you can't because you don't read. You don't read. And if you do read, you don't have the time to seriously sit down and reflect on what you have read and to make the comparisons and the contrasts. And if you can't do that, then you have not, it would not, it would have been better if you had not read because you're not different from the man who has not read. So, that is what we see down in the country. And it is something that we have to, we have to um, carefully analyze. We have to carefully an analyze. I'm not sure what this thing is doing um, in my space at the moment. Okay, so let me see. Okay, let me see here. It was something that popped up on my screen and I was wondering what's going on here. Uh, I sorry, I'm sorry about that. So this is the, I want to show you this. Let me share my screen about the IMF dead trap. And Africa understands what role the IMF plays. Jamaica doesn't understand that yet. They're in a quandary and they are, I guess, bamboozled by the IMF. But let's see what they are saying on this program. The IMF and the West dead trapped Ethiopia. Yeah. Now, Ethiopia was a symbol of African independence. It, it, it used to be known for its independent and distinctive life and culture. Uh, it has since found itself in a web of financial dependency woven by the International Monetary Fund. Mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia's dance with the IMF began began innocuously all the way back in 1947 when it became the first country to request a loan from that newly formed institution. So IMF opens its doors and they say, can we have money? Though initially rebuffed, this marked the beginning of a financial entanglement that would span decades. By the late 1970s, Ethiopia was borrowing regularly from the IMF, setting the stage for a cycle of debt that is persisting today. So as Ethiopia grappled with poverty and limited access to basic services in the 90s and 2000s, the IMF and World Bank increased their involvement under the guise of development support. But this aid came at a steep price. The loans 
that they gave them were bundled with stringent conditions that often prioritized Western economic ideologies over Ethiopia's unique needs. So uh, the true cost of this relationship became painfully clear uh, just recently in 2020 when the IMF approved 3.4 billion financing package for Ethiopia. So they just keep giving and giving and giving with larger interests and more strings attached to make it so they really get trapped in a cycle. The result of all this, a shocking 30% devaluation of the Ethiopian beer against the US dollar, sending shockwaves to the economy. So, you know, obviously people are arguing that the IMF and the World Bank's lending practices amount to a modern form of economic colonialism. Structural adjustment programs demanded as loan conditions have been particularly controversial. Now we've talked about this, Mike. They say, if you can't pay, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to come in and we're going to make you devalue your currency. We're going to come in and tighten your belt, and make you cut all those social spending programs to choke out and kill as many poor people as possible. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to privatize all your stuff, okay? Your mines and your ports and all the important resources in your country. We're going to make you privatize it. And then we're going to send in our buddies from Halliburton to drill all that oil and, and mine all that stuff, you know, and... That's the Trojan horse of Western imperialism that comes right in the door after these IMF loans. So it's a great strategy. It doesn't necessarily need bombs until, you know, there's a socialist upheaval. But most of the time, it works. Keeping the people in debt and, uh, you know, absconding with the resources of the country. Uh, right. So that is what the IMF does. And this is something that we need to explore and we need to highlight. I don't think we need to explore it. I think it's just it's an open secret that the IMF is a structural neoliberal um, institution. And it's not there to build your economy. It is there to instead recolonize, as it were, your country, to re-enslave the indigenous people living in that society. And if you look at the economy of Argentina, that was known before the 1990s to be the, the, the Paris of Latin America. And look at what Argentina is right now. You'll understand. And there are many economies, but Jamaica is going to be um, written in history as one of the most, um, well, one of the countries in which the IMF was able to do whatever it wants to do, right? And created a, or an entrenched system of poverty in that nation, right? An entrenched system of poverty that is going to take generations to undo, right? The poverty that is coming out of Jamaica is going to require generations to undo. And if even if we do it today, it's going to take generations. Imagine if we put a pause on it, which we have been doing, by fooling ourselves that what we're doing with the IMF and what the IMF is doing in Jamaica is something that is going to be helpful for us. Until we begin to confront the truth, then we are. it's going to take a longer time, which is going to be impossible to get rid of, unless we just have an ethnic cleansing and cleanse the society of all the poverty that we see there and the poor people, which is not something that is going to be a moral agenda. Right? But until we begin to acknowledge that this is a problem and that the IMF is, and the World Bank are not there to assist us in our development, then we are going to remain in the hands of these people, in the claws of these structural adjustment ideologues. Right? That is what, we, what is going to happen to us, and we'll never become a fully free and prosperous nation. It will always be Jamaica a paradise for the wealthy, for foreigners, for tourists, and a living hell for ordinary Jamaicans, for the masses of Jamaicans there who live on the soil. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you'll like and you'll share and you'll subscribe. Remember now that you have to like the video. It doesn't cost you a thing. Just hit the like button on the button as soon as you open up the video so that the video can be shared. I think you're selfish when you don't put a like on the video because then the video will not be shared with others 
on the platform. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you in another video. All the best.